walked into the hotel yesterday and I saw the big sign that said, The Road to Success. You know, there's a lot of roads that we can all take to certain success in our lives. Some people are lucky enough to get on the expressway and get there rather quickly. Others, more on a two-lane highway that there's a little more stop and go. And for some, myself included, the road sometimes is a little rockier, a little bumpier, a few more curves. But no matter what road you take or are given, I promise you if you continue to move forward in the right direction, you will achieve success if you want it. A lot of people look at that video or look at my running resume and they think, my gosh, Dick, I'll bet you out of high school you probably got a full ride scholarship and ran for the University of Minnesota, those golden gophers. Well, kind of, sort of, but not really. I did run for the University of Minnesota slash Wasika, a small little two-year agricultural college in Wasika, Minnesota, which is now a federal prison, so it kind of tells you about where I got my degree from. <laughs> but that's a whole other story. But I had a coach there who is still to this day very, very close to me. There will be people in your lives that you'll never forget. And when somebody says something to you, whether it be positive or negative, you never know how it's going to affect that person at that moment, later in the day, tomorrow, next week, next month, or years down the road. And one day after practice, my coach, Dr. John Fulcrod, as we're walking back in to the locker room, he put his arm around me and he says, you know what, Dick? I really believe you can become as good of a runner as you want to be. And I never, ever forgot that. I was fortunate after that school, I did get a little bit of a scholarship to go out and run for South Dakota State out in Brookings, South Dakota. I was there to run, not really do schoolwork. Met a young gal, decided we're going to get married. I'm thinking, that's it. I quit school. I had my two-year associate's degree. What more do I need? Moved back to the farm, was going to milk cows the rest of my life. Raise a bunch of kids. Life was good. One afternoon, I'm getting ready to go out to do my chores, and I grabbed the mail out of the post box, threw it on the table, and... I saw one of my running magazines had come, opened it up, saw an article in there what it took to qualify for the 1980 Olympic marathon trials. You had to run two hours, 21 minutes, and 56 seconds. My best at that point for a marathon was almost 16 minutes slower than that. But I remember reading that article, and I'm in my stinky coveralls getting ready to go out and milk my cows, and I'm thinking... Remember what Coach Fulcrod said, Dick. He said, Dick, you can become as good of a runner as you want to be. Never, though, in my wildest dreams did I ever think that when I graduated from high school in May of 1975, did I ever think that a short seven years later, I'd be standing in a little town called Hopkinton, Massachusetts, getting ready for the greatest foot race in the world, the Boston Marathon. That race was held 27 years ago, what they dubbed the duel in the sun. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was 80 degrees at the start. The race back then started at 12 noon. I remember standing on that front row and the starter putting up his pistol saying, one minute! And I looked to my left and there are two men down from me as Alberto Salazar, the world record holder. To my right is Bill Rogers, four-time winner of the Boston Marathon. A little further down on that front line is Frank Shorter, the gold medalist and all these other world-class athletes and Olympians from around the globe. And I remember thinking, Dick, what in the heck are you doing on the same starting line with these guys? And it's easy to get intimidated sometimes. But when it went in this ear and came out the other side, I remember thinking to myself, Dick, you deserve to be here as much as anybody else. You've done the work. And with that, the gun went off, and Salazar shot out of there like he was shot out of a cannon. I was right behind him. We went through the first mile of that 26.2 mile race in 4 minutes and 33 seconds. And I am hanging on for dear life. And let me tell you, hanging on when you still have 25.2 miles to go is not a good thing. <laughs> but I remember thinking, Dick, just hang in there, buddy. You've done the work. You're going to start feeling better. I got to mile two. And I felt worse than I did at mile one, but I just kept telling myself, Dick, you've done the work, hang in there. 
I got to mile three. And I'll be honest with you, the thought crossed my mind about dropping out. I thought, Dick, you can't do that. That's the easy way to go. Drop out, make some excuse, nobody will know the difference. Hang in there, Dick, you've done the work. I got to mile four. I did not feel any better. But more importantly, I didn't feel any worse. And that was huge. By mile five, I felt just a little bit better. And by mile six, I remember thinking to myself, Dick, you're going to win the Boston Marathon. It took me six miles before I really started feeling like my body was ready to go. That's why for you young people out there that are just beginning maybe your sales career here with Whirlpool, and it's tough and you're trying to learn all these different things, all these different products, sometimes it gets overwhelming, but just hang in there. Because if you do, it will get better. You will start feeling like you're going to win that race. And as each mile went by, that lead group that we're in got less and less until we finally got to the 17-mile point and there's two guys left in the lead group. Sellers are the world record holder. And as the Boston newspaper had dubbed me the day before, Dick Beardsley, the country bumpkin from Minnesota. <laughs> Nobody had given me, or for that matter, anybody else a chance against Salazar. From 17 to 21 miles, it's for the most part all uphill. The last big, big hill is called Heartbreak Hill. I got to the top of Heartbreak Hill at 21 miles. I was in the lead. Alberta was right off my left shoulder. We came down a big downhill on the other side, and when I got to the bottom of that downhill, I could no longer feel my legs. The thought of having to run five more miles at the pace we were running or faster literally made me sick to my stomach. But I knew this. I knew I could suck it up enough to go one more mile. And the good Lord has given us this incredible gift between our ears called the brain, and it is some powerful stuff. And I was able to have my brain convince my body that all I had to do was run one more mile and I'm going to win the Boston Marathon. Next thing I know, I see the 22nd mile mark, still in the lead. I say it again, Dick, one more mile, you're going to win this race. The 23rd went by and then the 24th. I still got a stride and a half lead. And I will never forget as long as I live. I look down and I see in yellow and gold and blue paint. It said 25.2 miles. And right below that it said one mile to go. At that point I got so weak, kneed and rubber-legged, I didn't know if I'd be able to take another step. Tears just started streaming down my cheeks. For some reason I flashed back to that day in May of 1975 when I walked off my high school stage the first one in my family to ever get a high school diploma. And I walked out to where my mom and dad were sitting. And my dad, who had an eighth grade education, was crying. I handed my dad my diploma. He handed me a small envelope. He said, Dee, this is your graduation gift from your mom and I. I opened it up. Inside there was a small piece of paper. In my dad's eighth grade handwriting it said, Dee, this is good for round-trip airfare to the Boston Marathon. Maybe someday you'll want to run it. Love, Mom and Dad.